Well, welcome back to the Bible Reading Challenge podcast. My name is Aaron Ventura, and in this episode, we're going to look at the book of Proverbs. And just a reminder, you can find my notes for this show, plus a bunch of other free resources at localchristendom.com. And if you have questions you want answered in a future episode, you can also email me at aaronventura at gmail.com, or you can go to localchristendom.com and use the message box on the front page of the website. Well, let's talk about Proverbs. Proverbs is a training manual for princes. It is also the closest thing that we have to a parenting book in the Bible. This is God's curriculum to teach us how to grow up and how to exercise His righteous rule over the earth. In Hebrew, the word that gets translated as proverb is mashal, which is also the same word that means to rule or undertake something. We might say that proverbs are rules for reigning. They are God's inspired lessons for holy dominion. In Genesis 1.28, God gave to Adam the dominion mandate. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So Adam was born to be king over creation. But before he could rule the world, Adam first had to learn to rule himself. The Garden of Eden was then his proving ground. There he was tested, taught, and given responsibility. He was told to tend and keep the garden, name the animals, and not eat from one forbidden tree. If Adam obeyed these commands, trusting God, eventually he would be promoted from prince to king. He would be exalted and granted access to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, what this tree represented was kingship, the authority to rule and make judgments. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were sinning by grasping for something that they were not yet ready for. They were kind of like children who steal the butcher's knife before they know how to use a spoon. You know, don't ever let them do that. <laughs> this sin of impatience with God's timing and the belief that God was withholding good things from them is a perennial sin that we must overcome. It is the sin of unbelief that all of us must conquer, and Proverbs teaches us how to do that. It begins with the fear of the Lord, Proverbs 1.7. So what is the fear of the Lord? Faith in God and the fear of the Lord are essentially the same thing. Both require us to look outside of ourselves and unto God for everything. This is especially true when it comes to knowledge and wisdom. One of the ways you could define wisdom is as the ability to apply God's word in a variety of circumstances. Wisdom is the ability to apply God's word in a variety of circumstances. So for example, it's one thing to know the Ten Commandments. That's knowledge. But it's another thing to apply the Ten Commandments when you are the King of Israel. That requires wisdom. In 1 Kings 3, we are given a good example of this. Two harlots give birth on the same day. One of the babies dies in the night, and the mother of the dead baby switches it out for the living one. And then in the morning, the true mother discovers the crime that has been done against her. Of course, Solomon does not know who the true mother is, and so we have a classic case of one person's word against another. So how will Solomon apply God's word here? How is he going to give justice in this situation? Well, this gets at the essence of wisdom. There is no case law in the Torah for how to deal with this situation. So Solomon must devise a way to find out the truth. He's got to bring it out of them. To do this, he must employ a bit of stagecraft. Solomon is kind of like the original Sherlock Holmes or uh, the original Hercule Poirot. He calls for a sword and announces the child is to be cut in two. And of course, this provokes a response from each woman. The false mother says, yes, divide the child in half, while the true mother pleads with the king to spare the child, even if it means giving him to the other woman. From the mouth of each, Solomon is then able to discern the heart, and he gives the child, of course, to the rightful mother. It is this judgment that causes all Israel to fear the king. It says, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice, 1 Kings 3, 28. This story teaches us that wisdom is the ability to make distinctions. And the first distinction that we must make if we want to be wise is the distinction between God and man. God is infinite and knows everything. Man is finite and knows very little. Wisdom begins by acknowledging this. This is the fear of the Lord. 
all throughout the book of Proverbs, various things are going to be compared, contrasted, and juxtaposed for our contemplation. Some distinctions are really easy to make, for example, between lady folly and lady wisdom, or the wicked and the righteous. But some distinctions require a lot more thought and meditation. It requires us to ponder them. For example, Proverbs 26, 4-5 says this, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So there is time to answer a fool and a time not to. There is a time to speak and a time to remain silent. Proverbs sets these things next to each other, so we're forced to meditate upon them. And it is in the act of solving these riddles that we become wise. Some of the other distinctions that you will encounter in this book are between the wealthy and poor, lazy and diligent, violent and peaceful. There are friends to keep close and people to stay away from. There are liars and flatterers, honest men and truth tellers. There are rules and exceptions to the rule. There is causation and there is correlation, and these are not the same thing. Some proverbs are universally true, and others are highly situational. To give and receive good advice requires sensitivity to the time and the place and the persons involved. This is why it says things like, He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. Proverbs 18.13 Or, the one who states his case first seems right, until the other comes and examines him. Proverbs 18.17 so wisdom is quick to hear and slow to speak. One of the other major themes in Proverbs is distinguishing not just between good and evil, but between good and greater good, better and best. For example, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord, Proverbs 18.22. But it is better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman, Proverbs 21.9. So marriage is good, but marriage to a bad woman is worse than being unmarried, and best of all is to be married to a virtuous woman. That is great. To take another example, Proverbs has a lot to say about money, investing, wealth, and riches. Proverbs 22.4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. So riches, honor, and life are good gifts from God. However, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold, Proverbs 22.1. So riches are good, but a good name is better. And if you have to choose between them, choose the latter. And don't forget to factor in Proverbs 23.4-5, which says, Do not overwork to be rich. Because of your own understanding, cease. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. In other words, you need to know when to stop. Money may answer everything, Ecclesiastes 10.19, but money is not everything. So Proverbs gives us a hierarchy of what is important to God. To borrow from St. Augustine, it helps us order our loves. Jesus says that there are weightier matters of the law, like justice and mercy, and there are things of lesser weight, like tithing from your spice rack. Proverbs is meant to give us a healthy sense of proportion, to teach us that not everything is of equal importance. For Christians, the most difficult decisions that call for wisdom are not usually between good and evil, but between two seemingly equal goods. Wisdom is then the ability to discern which path to take when both look pretty similar, or even the same. Wisdom knows what hills are worth dying on and also when to retreat. In the New Testament, Jesus reveals himself as someone greater than Solomon. And one of the ways he demonstrates this is through teaching in parables. It says in Matthew 13, 34 to 35, all these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables. And without a parable, he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. The quotation here is from Psalm 78 2, and the word for parable there is mashal, proverb, which Matthew translates as parable. 
So proverbs and parables are the same thing. Both are meant to convey and to conceal the truth. This is why so many people can read the Bible or read Proverbs and yet come away with completely different and even opposite interpretations. Not everyone is good soil, and Proverbs or parables reveal who is who. Some people actually read the Bible and become more foolish and wicked as a result. They twist it to their own destruction. Meanwhile, those who are humble with ears to hear are transformed by the word and become loving, joyful, wise believers. This is what Jesus means when he says, For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Matthew 13, 12. I'll close with one suggestion for you as you read, and that is, look for all the nature references in this book. Proverbs is just a sample of Solomon's wisdom, but we are told this in 1 Kings 4. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Also, he spoke of trees, from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. So based on this passage, we might say that Solomon was the best scientist of his day. He studied nature and he categorized creation. And this should remind us of the very first job that Adam had, naming the animals. To name something is to exercise authority over it. Solomon is then a new Adam who has been given the fruit from the forbidden tree by the grace of God and is using it to glorify God. So look for the lessons that Solomon learned from creation, and then see if you can look at creation in that same way. I'll give you just a few examples of this. Proverbs 6, 5 says, Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, and like a bird from the hand of the fowler. So think about this. Here you are meant to think about how to escape based on how the gazelle or a bird escapes. You're supposed to imitate that. Well, the only way you could do this is if you have seen and know what a gazelle or a bird in action looks like. Or consider Proverbs 6.6, 6, Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. So there's a time for you to go look at ants. And Solomon says you can actually learn a lot of things from them. So what are those lessons? <laughs> Message me, let me know. What do you learn from the ants? Lastly, consider Proverbs 30, 18 to 19, which says, There are three things which are too wonderful for me, yes, four which I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a virgin. Creation is full of God's marvelous works. There are opportunities to learn wisdom all around us. So learn from Solomon the wisdom lessons that he has given, the ones that are really plain to us right there on the surface of the text, but also learn from Solomon how to read creation. Learn from Solomon how to read the world. Well, that is just a little taste of the many good things that you will find in the book of Proverbs. If you want to see an outline of the book, you can go to localchristendom.com and uh, see it there. You'll also find a list I have compiled of some of my favorite resources on the book of Proverbs. I'll mention just a couple of them right now. Uh, one of them is Solomon Says by Mark Horn, which is a great book, especially if you have teenage or college age sons. It's a book I would highly recommend. Another is by my, actually my new co-worker, uh, Jared Longshore, and it's called Wisdom for Kings and Queens. And I might try to get Jared on here in a future episode uh, to talk about it. So uh, that's all for now. Until next time, keep on reading.